Now, some political observers are calling these midterms the dark election. That's a reference to the huge amounts of undisclosed money being spent on campaigning. Our business correspondent, Owen Faircloth, is with me now. Owen. Elaine, it was a landmark reform here in the U.S. a few years ago, four years ago, that transformed the way uh, people spend money on elections. In this election, the real beneficiaries are nonprofit groups and charities who are able to spend unlimited amounts of money on adverts while walking a careful line on what constitutes political activities. Politician Amy Bilgard's Alison Grimes and her campaign. And who's his candidate? Alice. They say money talks. And on TV and the internet, it's talking louder than ever, thanks to an unprecedented amount of campaign money contributions and spending. The Center for Responsive Politics estimates that out of $3.6 billion spent by Democrats and Republicans, at least $154 million is undisclosed. Millions have been spent on advertisements aimed at destroying opponents of candidates. But many of the organizations paying for them are accused of not being transparent. And that's largely down to a landmark legal reform passed here at the US Supreme Court four years ago. It allows anonymous donors to channel unlimited amounts of money into special nonprofit groups that might be involved in education, science, religion, or even sport. And unlike conventional political parties and other political groups, these organizations don't have to disclose where the money came from or how much they have. At Alliance Defending Freedom, we share a belief, a fundamental truth. The catch that is that these organizations are supposed to limit their political activities so their adverts aren't supposed to encourage viewers freedom, to vote for a particular candidate. This one was made by Alliance Defending Freedom, a group lobbying primarily for religious freedom. In a statement to CCTV, the group said it was a non-partisan legal advocacy organization that isn't involved in political campaigns or campaigning. At this Washington church being used as a polling station, there's concern about the impact of these groups on elections. Should be required to disclose their donors. Um, if I'm supporting a candidate, um, I shouldn't have to be anonymous to do that, especially with all the money that they're giving. The end of President Barack Obama's second and final term in two years' time means potentially fresh faces fighting for the presidency. And that's expected to drive campaign spending to even greater levels. So who can afford to put up the kind of money often millions of dollars to finance these campaigns and the groups behind them? That was a question I put to Meredith McGeehy, the policy director for the Campaign Legal Center, which works for greater transparency in politics. It could be corporate money. It could be individual money. It even could be foreign money. And we really be, have no clue because the disclosure regime in place is just too weak. And that's the big concern, isn't it, the heart of the matter. There are some people who think that essentially the system and the, the contributions and the financing is out of control. When you had this Supreme Court decision called Citizens United, what it said was that corporations have the right to spend money in elections using their corporate treasury funds. That's billions of dollars. But there are also other decisions that then started allowing people to stay in the dark to be able to spend money on influencing the outcome of elections and nobody knows who they are. We think this should obviously be changed, that sunlight is indeed the best disinfectant. But right now, this election, this is the dark money election. And that's because there is just so much money pouring into, not these candidates, but these uh, super PACs, the political action committees, and particularly these social welfare groups that are actually able to do the lobbying on behalf of these candidates. Well, really what's happening is with the dark money, this is money that's usually going into political advertisements on television, and we don't know what the source of the funds is. If it's a super PAC, they actually do have to disclose their donors. So you have money that's going to the candidates, you have money that's going to the super PACs, both of those disclosed, and then you have the money that's coming from the dark money groups. This is all pouring into campaigns, and I would note most of it into negative political advertising from the outside groups. Are we saying then that these are very, very wealthy and private donors who just don't want to be known? Well, I'm going to give you a shocking fact. Right now, less than 1%, far less than 1% of all Americans even give $200 or more to a candidate. This is just in a, not even talking about some of the larger money. 
So you can imagine who are the people and who, what are the sources that are pouring billions of dollars in when an average American doesn't even give $200. This shows that this is the, the very, very elite that have a lot at stake in terms of the power and who are dominating our political conversation and making it, you know, moving toward an oligarchical system, at least in the political system. And that's a troubling factor, even though in the end what they're trying to do is influence voters' opinions. So the voters still obviously have a role to play. One thing I read that interests me is that the Supreme Court, and I'm paraphrasing hugely here, one thing they said was that essentially we live in an age where it's easy to get on the internet and do your research and find out who these people are sometimes. Is that fair? Is the Supreme Court saying that everybody can inform themselves in an age when we can get information instantaneously? Well, the Supreme Court, even though it decided by an 8-to-1 measure that there should be disclosure, was very ill-informed as to what the current law is. Uh, this notion that you can go onto the Internet and find out the sources of this dark money pouring into races is just wrong. It's false. We've been pushing a lot to try and in improve that disclosure. There's been legislation introduced in Congress to try and in improve disclosure and make the promise uh, that the Supreme Court gave match the reality. Right now, those are totally out of sync. If you look across the world, there are many countries who have limits on financing and this kind of thing. Is there any country that's doing it right? Is there any country that the U.S. could learn from? You know, I think it's very hard to look at other countries and, and look at models because with our Constitution, we are fairly unique. Um, so uh, obviously I see a lot of countries, uh, someplace like Australia, where you hear the voter turnout is so high. And, you know, you look at that and say, how do they do that? You know, mandatory voting. I don't know that we can look at those models. However, I think what we can do is look even toward our own model of where, uh, where does it work even here in the states where people really get out and get engaged. So I think there's an opportunity for the American people to kind of take control of the system again, but it's going to be a struggle. Right now, the people that have the, the system captured, they're not going to just like go and say, oh, never mind. You know, they're, they're going to hold on for dear life. That was Meredith McGeehee of the Campaign Legal Center. Uh, you know, Owen, this is a massive amount of money being spent, almost $4 billion just for these uh, elections here alone. Does the most money win the race? The short answer, uh, Elaine, is yes, it does. And it has done uh, President Barack Obama when he was running for re-election in 2012. His Democratic Party roughly outspent the Republicans around two to one on TV and radio advertising, around $400 million. There are plenty of other examples going back through the political history of the US where candidates have simply bitten the dust because of TV and radio advertising uh, concentrated on that candidate. It's usually negative advertising as well that seems to work. And certainly in this election cycle as well, most most of the advertising is negative, knocking down candidates. One thing these groups will have to consider going forward, though, is they spend a lot of this money on conventional TV ads and radio. But we know that more and more people are moving away from traditional television. It's much easier on the internet to simply click off an advert and move away from it if you don't want to, rather than having that advert sort of bombarded at you. That is something they'll have to consider going forward. For now, though, these groups seem to be happy putting all that money into traditional TV advertising. All right, Owen Fairclough, thank you so much.